Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to have the chance to give a talk within this prestigious seminar. And the talk is about our ion cell technology. And we think it's a sustainable way to produce textile and technical fibers. The challenge of uh, global microplastic emission is highly associated with the textile industry, unfortunately. And for this reason, I would like to briefly address this issue in my introduction. Microplastic emissions directly threaten our global water resources, and it's therefore of uh, utmost importance that we develop ways and means to effectively address this threat. The reduction of the microplastics emission is defined in the emission one of the well-known Ellen MacArthur Foundation's report. Now, what is actually the extent of the threat? The annual global production of plastic products uh, is currently around 380 million tons per year, of which 58% uh, enter the environment. In 2016, 19 to 23 million tons of plastic waste entered into the aquatic ecosystem. And the contribution of the textile industry is given as specific values, what you can read here, 0 0.12 to 0 0.31 kilogram microplastics per ton of washed fabric. And according to the current estimates, about 200,000 tons of microplastics from the textile industry end up in the water bodies, mostly in the ocean. Um, the results uh, show that the efforts required to meaningfully reduce plastic emissions by 2030 are extremely challenging. If things remain as they are now, plastic emissions to the aquatic ecosystem will near, nearly triple by 2030. And the best case scenario is given here and envisions a 40% reduction um, of the amount of plastic waste generated, which goes far beyond the elimination of single-use plastic products. Uh, uh, you know, all of you know the EU uh, rule now to avoid single-use plastic products. And we need additional uh, strict measures in all countries. Only a transformative change of the policy will achieve substantial reduction. In recent years, uh, the Reno Scripps Institute close to San Diego has conducted an extensive study on the behavior of various textile fabrics in the sea. Some of you might have read the papers. And here you see uh, a deconstruction of material samples under real conditions on the sea surface. The fabric swatches made from lyocell fibers uh, turned into a large biofilm that gradually consumed its original framework of fibers making the swatch falling apart. Uh, as you can see here, after 28 days, basically it has disappeared. Uh, this is totally different when you uh, do the same with PT fabrics. Even after 20, uh, 210 days in seawater, hardly any changes is visible. And um, so it's not even a, a, a hydrophobic biofilm form. The biodegradability of the two materials was also tested in a bioreactor by the same research team. Of course, there are many other similar uh, studies on the biodegradation. But this uh, actually confirmed that uh, under the seawater conditions, uh, within 60 days, uh, lyocell fibers have been fully biodegraded, and in freshwater, within 90 days. The biodegradation model used suggests that polyester fibers, which was followed up only for, let's say, 100 days, would need to be exposed to the marine environment for centuries. To fully degrade. That's all not new, but I think it's uh, important uh, to show here. Now, to contribute to these multiple environmental problems of the textile industry, uh, several sustainable man-made cellulose technologies are currently under development, 
man-made cellulose is an, a term which is not uh, very appreciated by many people. It basically means that uh, these are fibers made from cellulose of uh, um, typically from uh, wood or from natural resources. Yeah. So this uh, you can also say, okay, that uh, yeah, regenerated cellulose fibers if you wish. The key is to use uh, renewable resources such uh, as lignocellulose as a raw material, which uh, <clears throat> um, equals the ambition to in this uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation's report. I will first start with the wet spinning processes to give you an overview. Many of you know that, but it's just a repetition. So this is the wet spinning process. And of course, the reference is the viscous uh, process, which is by far the most uh, abundant one and has been using renewable raw materials, pulp and cotton, linters and so forth, since more than 120 years. Um, despite tremendous improvements in the environmental footprint over the years, especially in the 80s, 90s, uh, the use of toxic CS2 and incomplete recovery of key chemicals like sulfate, for example, uh, still remain. So there is uh, no way to further clean that up with economical means. So <clears throat> the carbamate process developed almost 50 years ago already. Uh, partly also in Finland, but already previously at Dupont in the end of the 30s, has been revived, improved, and adapted for the use of uh, cellulosic textile waste. And there are also some uh, commercialization efforts ongoing in Finland. Aqueous sodium hydroxide solution um, with some additives as a solvent for cellulose is used in several novel processes, such as the tree to textile, a famous development in Sweden, but also the biocell sold in, in Finland. Um, they basically use the um, effect, which was detected by Subwe many, many years back, that under certain conditions, uh, Cellulose is soluble, at least uh, low molar mass. Cellulose is soluble in aqueous sodium hydroxide solutions. However, uh, in recent times, uh, a new feature has been uh, developed, namely uh, the change in the composition of the spinning bath, which allows now a better recovery of the chemicals in the spin bath. Um, the spinover process, uh, what is indicated here on the bottom, is based on converting commercially available pulp fibers. They are not dissolved. Typically, they use uh, MCC, microcrystalline cellulose, and they con convert uh, this uh, suspension into a hydrogel and uh, form a fiber by adding uh, salts, calcium salts, for example, as a binder, an alginate as a as a sustainable crosslinker and extruding them into, a, um, into fibers in a specially designed spinneret. So these are also um, very recent innovations and partly they're on the way for commercialization already. The second category of man-made cellulose fiber processes concerns the dry jet wet spinning process. Uh, the only commercial process, uh, as you know, is the lyosyl process, uh, which uses NMMO as a solvent, uh, to be correct, NMMO monohydrate, um, as such as uh, Lensing does uh, for the production of tensile fibers, but now also other companies, especially in Asia. With the rediscovery of ionic liquids as powerful cellulose solvents in 2001 by Rogers and his co-workers, uh, the development of suitable ionic liquids as cellulose solvents has been massively undertaken by research groups worldwide aiming to develop alternative lyosyl spinning processes. Of the processes currently being tested on a pilot scale, I would like to single out just two of them, of course, our ion cell process, which uh, I will present, of course, in detail now, and also an invention or a development in southern Germany. Uh, called hypercell process, uh, where a modified imidazolium-based ionic liquid is used, and also they have announced 
uh, the um, building of a pilot plant. Now I want to turn to a deeper description of the ion salt process. So the uh, cellulose solvents of the ion salt process used are protic ionic liquids, which have enormous uh, dissolving power and are also environmentally friendly and non-toxic. That's a prerequisite, of course. Uh, currently, we work with three different, both amidinium and guanidinium based superbase based ionic liquids. They are all acetates. And we use, as you see here, uh, amidinium ones, uh, cations, uh, this DPN and DPU, and, but also guanidinium MTBD. The lysosome process is characterized in general by very few steps. So we have just three major steps, dissolution, then spinning, and uh, after treatment, that's a, a big difference to the viscous process, for example. Yeah? And uh, um, in the lyocell, in the ion cell process, we only use one chemical, and that is the ionic liquid, which, and this is a prerequisite, has to be almost quantitatively recycled, otherwise it will not be commercially feasible. Um, <clears throat> Annette mentioned uh, um, thermoplasts. Unfortunately, cellulose is not a thermoplast, so we need a solvent. Uh, and of course, the uh, solution, the, cellul uh, the cellulose solution we form has a specific uh, rheological behavior, and that is very key. For that, uh, we produced uh, a 13 weight percent cellulose solution using a typical commercial birch tree hydrolysis craft top. And we compared the rheological behavior of such solutions using the three. Uh, ionic liquids, what we use, then as a reference also MM acetate and the NMMO. And what you see here is the so-called uh, uh, relax relaxation time spectrum calculated from uh, frequency sweep measurements. So this is very indicative. The curve maximum is a relative measure of uh, the weight average molar mass uh, with a longer relaxation time corresponding to higher molar mass and a shift to lower relaxation times revealing lower elastic and more pronounced viscous behavior. You see that more or less um, the um, ion cell fibers, uh, ion cell dopes and also the NMMO dope behave similarly, but there is a significant difference when you dissolve cellulose in MM acetate. This uh, just shows that it is not sufficient to detect a cellulose solvent, uh, but also the effect of the solvent uh, in the rheological behavior. So not every cellulose solvent is really suitable for a lyocell process. Um, <clears throat> so what you see while the uh, three ion cell solvents have, uh, show a similar distribution, yeah, uh, this is not the case for the MM acetate. And this indicates already poor spinability and uh, this has been realized also, also experimentally, especially those uh, solutions are prone to capillary breaches. Now the question arises if differences in the fiber structure formation exist between the NMMO-based ion cell process and the ion cell process. For that, we went to Grenoble and did some synthrotron experiments at ESRF. Uh, and compared typically cellulose solutions in NMMO and the cellulose solution in an ionic liquid, in this particular case, DBNH acetate. What you see here is uh, that in the wax spectrum, uh, that um, um, <clears throat> during the gradual regeneration, um, there is a clear uh, uh, detection of crystalline peaks here. Yeah? Uh, this is uh, not the case with the DBNH acetate, so that we don't see any crystallization during these first steps of regeneration. And we attribute that, that probably the cation is still strongly bound to the cellulose chain, and the crystallization process starts only with progressive regeneration, which was not uh, followed up. What we also saw in the small angle X-ray scattering 
we saw also indications for spinodal decomposition. Yeah? That has been also speculated for many years already that lyocell, uh, lyocell uh, elements regeneration follow spinodal decomposition. While the spinability of all three ion cell cellular solutions is stable, as well as in the case of the NMMO cellular solution, the resulting uh, fiber properties differ sometimes significantly. Yeah? So you see here a typical, I hope you see it in the video. So we have first a little bit of random extrusion of filaments, but now they are very, really parallel as soon as they are stretched. Um, <clears throat> what we also see is uh, that uh, as a function of the draw ratio, uh, there are significant differences between uh, the uh, different solutions. Uh, NMMO is clearly, um, shows clearly the lowest tenacity values. Uh, that's also reflected in the stress strain curves. Of course, the differences are not uh, significant or not, not so relevant for textile purposes. They might be relevant for technical applications. And um, the, the difference in the mechanical properties is uh, reflected also in both in crystalline and amorphous orientation as a function of the draw ratio. As you see here, all the fibers spun from ionic liquids have higher values in both crystalline and amorphous uh, orientation. However, all lyocell fibers have in common that they are strong have a silky appearance and a good handle. So that, that is true for all the lyocell fibers. What we see as the great potential of the lyocell process uh, is the possibility uh, to really do chemical recycling of uh, textile wastes or even upcycling of worn cellulose textiles. And this is very important and also reflected in ambition three of uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's report, um, namely that we have to improve the longevity of textiles and also the durability. And that requires strong fibers, mechanically strong fibers, stable fibers. I propose three examples. We made many, many trials. Uh, and uh, but of course uh, time is limited so I have to uh, limit myself to three important trials. The first one is um, the recycling of cardboard waste. This is a very big task because it's basically composed uh, 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 as wood so there is in the composition of difference and of course we need to pretreat uh, the cardboard waste that's of course necessary and I show you the effect of different pretreatments on the fiber properties and of course you see the extent of pretreatments also has an effect on the properties and also on the, and the, and the appearance. If we start only with the removal of the fines this is a, a treatment for example in a sentry cleaner then we do not change the composition, the chemical composition. And we were very surprised to see that it was possible to spin fibers. And you see in the stress strain curve, it's not very, uh, very good. It's below viscose, uh, but it was spinnable. Yeah? And that is also reflected here in the tenacity toughness diagram, where you see also the field here of the commercial uh, regenerated cellulose fibers. However, when we remove the lignin now, we used craft lignin or organo salt delignification. Sorry, we, we did not use craft lignin, craft delignification. Um, then there was a steep increase in the stress strain behavior. So B2 fiber also reflected here in the tenacity toughness diagram. When we remove all the lignin by additional bleaching activities, there is not only a slight improvement, which was somehow expected a little bit, the toughness has increased because the extensibility of the fiber has improved. When we also remove, uh, let's say 50% of the hemicellulose by cool caustic extraction, and we get another boost in the increase in tenacity, which is also reflected here. 
And the final one is that we also re, uh, remove all the lignin by additional bleaching, and we get an additional increase of uh, stress um, reflected here. So um, what we can conclude here is that uh, overall we obtained excellent fibers, maybe except B1, and we could produce nice textile fibers and our designers were able to uh, create really very appealing textile fabrics. Here you see a selection of those fabrics. So this, this was an old cardboard. Another example reflects uh, the uh, difference between mechanical and chemical recycling, because nowadays uh, old textiles are typically recycled uh, mechanically. Uh, that is possible, uh, but with some restrictions. Um, you, we started with uh, cotton roll towels. This has a certain abundancy, especially here also in Finland. And we used uh, two post-consumer cotton roll towels, one blue and one white. Um, the only pretreatment necessary was to adjust the DP. And we used in this particular case, um, relatively mild um, um, aqueous sulfuric acid treatment and you see uh, due to the difference in the increase uh, in the initial viscosity, we had to adjust uh, the conditions so that we end up between 400 and 500 milliliters per gram. This pretreated uh, material was uh, could be spun in an excellent way. We had stable spinning, and you see also the stress strain curves of the fibers. So we did not remove the dye, for example. Uh, not at all, it's a reactive dye, so it was no problem. We could pre, pre, uh, keep it uh, in the fibers. And uh, the stress strain curves clearly say a double of the tenacity compared to fresh cotton. Yeah, so it's incredibly high. And uh, this is also reflected here, what you see here. So it's more than uh, almost doubled of the uh, conventional lyocell. So the reason is because that's cotton and cotton is very pure. So we don't have hemicellulosis, which would impair the strength properties. And what we could show is that we could also retain uh, this high tenacity in the yarn. And here you see the difference between uh, the mechanical recycled, which is uh, shown as the warp B, blue, and warp W, white. So when we compare the, chemically, uh, the, the yarn from the chemically recycled fibers, this is three times higher. So it's above 30 centinewton per tex. So when you compare the best yarn from uh, lyocell fibers is around 22, 23 centinewton and it's still 10 uh, centinewton per tex higher. So what we can conclude is the ion cell process really allows upcycling of post-consumer cotton weaves. We have shown that with many other similar raw materials from natural fibers hemp quite recently. And so this, this is clear. The final example, I will show you the successful separation of PET and cellulose. Why is that important? Yeah, this is the most abundant uh, textile waste we have. And we need to find a solution how to uh, uh, recycle these kind of uh, blends, PET and cellulose. For that, we used uh, a 50-50 blend, and what we did is we, again, adjusted the BDP of the cellulose. In this particular case, we did a gas phase ozonation that had different reasons. So we can use also electron beam irradiation would be, I think, the most appropriate one. It's very simple. So you don't need to uh, put it into an aqueous uh, suspension. And with this pretreated, uh, we could directly, and you, you see here also this B-modal molar mass distribution, uh, where you see that uh, you have both polymers here, the PET, and here the cotton, and the spinning um, was then conducted when, you, when we prepared the dough from the cellulose, and that was possible by selectively extraction uh, extracting the cellulose fraction from this blend here by the solution, preparing uh, the dope. You see here also in the molar mass distribution, the separation of these two polymers. And then the filter 
residue was the PET. We had some degradation of the PET, and therefore uh, we had to uh, further clean it by successive ionic liquid extractions to keep the cellulose content um, to a level so that it can be used. And with chain extension, uh, it was possible then uh, to produce PET5, but that was not our responsibility. So we took this uh, cellulose solution or the spin dope and produced uh, under stable spinning so-called microfibers. And uh, you see also that the properties of these fibers were at least at the level of uh, the best commercial fibers. So we can conclude ion cell enables complete separation of uh, PET cellulose from waste and also upcycling, upcycling of the cellulose fibers. So finally, I would like to give you a brief outlook on our research activities uh, to simultaneously improve the stretchability and the tenacity of the ion cell fibers. And the aim is uh, to enter into the market segment of PT fibers. This is one of the drawbacks that so far man-made cellulose fibers and including uh, cotton, by the way, it's not possible to enter into this portfolio because PT fibers are typically very tough. Of, of course, they also have other properties which uh, are hard to achieve with cellulose-based fibers, but um, we want to now start to approach at least the toughness level uh, of the uh, conventional PT fibers. What can we do here with the ion cell? So to, with the linear stiff polymer uh, to simultaneously increase tensile and elongation is very difficult. One possibility, and that is also not completely new, is to change from a standard grade pulp. This is a birch pre-hydrolysis craft pulp with a relatively high amount of hemicellulosis with a highly purified pulp. It's an acetate grade pulp, for example, or for uh, cord uh, fibers. Um, and you see that, of course, we have here an enrichment of the long chains. We have a narrower molar mass distribution and we have much lower amounts of middle and low molar mass. And with that, it was really possible just by changing the, uh, the, uh, the pulp, otherwise the same conditions, we could uh, clearly enhance the tenacity at the target linear density of around 1.3 to 1.5 DTEX. So there is a quite nice gap between these two levels. And that is translated also into the uh, fiber toughness. So just by changing the pulp, quality, we could achieve quite nice toughness values. So uh, when you recall, um, tensile fibers have a toughness of around 50 to 55 in the best case. So we end up uh, at almost 90 megapascal. So it's a real improvement. Um, we can at the moment explain the superior properties in strength by the higher sharing power due to increased solution viscosity, a uh, more cohesive uh, cellulose network um, <clears throat> due to, to longer and more uniform chains, which lead also to a more extended hydrogen bonded supramolecular structure. The second possibility to enhance the fiber toughness independently of the uh, raw material properties um, is the use of spinnerets with specially designed capillaries, typically with uh, longer capillaries. Uh, for that, we made trials with, uh, with 100 micron diameter uh, orifices with a different length to diameter ratio. You can read it here. And this elongated cylindrical part of the spinning capillary causes a significant concomitant increase in fiber strength. And what you see here, the toughness is uh, almost 30 megapascal higher just by changing uh, from uh, 0 0.2 to 1.0 using the same raw material. So it's not a change. So we always use the same material. 
And uh, this means that we uh, gradually approach, we are not there in the polyester area. So this is the toughness. These are the fibers, this is normal viscose. This is the strongest commercial fibers with the highest toughness. Supercore three, tensile is a little bit lower and the high tenacity ion cell 94 was our record uh, is already on the way to um, touch the border of the, of the uh, polyester fibers. Now, we made some uh, SANS measurements, so small angle neutron scattering, and uh, we found three uh, differences. Uh, the first one is the higher tilt angle between crystallites, increased interlinks uh, between crystalline and amorphous domains. Then also a longer uh, periodicity, so the long period, which is basically the total length of the crystalline and the amorphous part. So this is the long period that is clearly longer as compared to the fibers made from um, the less tough fibers. And thirdly, and that was very surprising, uh, we read uh, that also for synthetic fibers, that those with high toughness show a lower micro void orientation. Yeah? So that allows a higher stretchability while keeping high tenacity. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I come to the end and I want to summarize the following. Yes, I hope I could show that ion cell is possible uh, and capable to upcycle cotton waste. So far, we don't know how many times, so that's ongoing work. Um, all the trials, all the results shown here for the staple fibers, exceed with one exception. This is was the, the, the pure cardboard just after removal of the fines, but all the others uh, were above the uh, level of commercial fibers when you ever when you look at the tenacity toughness diagram. This is our maximum, the world record of ion cell fibers. And um, what we could show here is also that we are able uh, to selectively separate PET from cellulose. The reason is the solvent uh, does not dissolve any PET uh, molecules. So that is an advantage. It's a powerful solvent, but only for hydrophilic polymers. And then I showed also that the chemical recycling is really a prerequisite for sustainable textile production. Mechanical recycling is not sufficient for the future. And I also highlighted at the end, the potential to improve um, tenacity and the elongation of the fibers. So to reach toughness values, at least become closer to the toughness values to PET. We're not yet there, but uh, that's the next challenge we have to face. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it was my great pleasure to give you an update on our ion cell activities and I'm happy to take questions. So thank you a lot for a very nice presentation. Uh, we will have questions with the time uh, and uh, Roland and I will try to uh, chip in. Uh, should I start to ask a question? We have already uh, in a, a question in the chat. Oh, if good. We, if we can good. start. Yeah, from... then we take yeah, uh, let me take I, that. I don't know. No. Mm -hmm. Do we read them or can the... Uh, 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 maybe they can unmute. Uh, otherwise, we read it. Okay. You, you, you can read it. So a question from Alamir. Alamin, I appreciate the work done, Professor Sixta. The concern with the use of ILS is their cost, which is relatively expensive. Have you studied their recoverability and reuse? Dear Roland, you are totally right. But if we are not able to 100% recycle the solvent, then there is no reason to commercialize this concept. This was not subject of our work. Uh, I want to add that we have now built a pilot plant. It's a small pilot plant, but uh, the pilot plant includes also the solvent recovery. And uh, we had the same discussions uh, with when we established the NMMO-based lyocell uh, process in Lansing. Uh, 
uh, the solvent is so, so expensive and uh, this is prohibitive and whatever. Uh, no, now it's the lowest cost of the whole production. So the highest cost is always the pulp or the raw material. And when we are able to take in the waste, then we can even reduce the cost. Fantastic, many thanks. Do we have more? Uh, I, then I can uh, ask you a, a technical question about in the one third in your uh, presentation, you talked about spinodal decomposition. Uh, can you a little bit uh, elaborate around that and what effects does it have? Does, is the process, uh, how fast you process it, will that change the structure of how long the spinal decomposition yeah. have occurred? At the moment, it's just a hypothesis. It's, it was okay. not, uh, not proven, but it's uh, more or less mirror imaged also in the structure. The, when you look at the cross section, compared to all other fibers where we know that we have a nucleation growth uh, process, uh, we have uh, uniform nanocapillaries. That is a, a typical sign of uh, spinodal decomposition. So you have a very homogeneous structure. And uh, there were also other speculations already in the past by others, uh, a group of Navar, for example, Professor Navar, uh, but uh, we have to admit it's not uh, proven. Yeah, it's not proven. The implication is normally that it should be spontaneously diffusion-driven uh, phase separation. That is basically the definition of spinodal decomposition. Yes, but my question was more, uh, if you freeze, freeze the, the, the formation of the fiber differently fast, will that change the structure? Because... Uh, it is, uh, since it's, it's a diffusion process, it will take yeah, different. Exactly. Diffusion is not a very fast process. No. Uh, we were very surprised and um, uh, when we saw that we did not see any crystalline peaks uh, of the regenerated uh, cellulose fibers from ion cell, we have to first of all repeat that, repeat that to confirm that. And then we need to uh, continue the search at which point, at which death in the regeneration bath, then the cellulose really starts to regenerate and crystallize. Yeah? There is a very nice work um, from the eight, end of 80s, or was it beginning 90s, I don't really come, from Mortimer. Uh, this was uh, a researcher who has been working with Courteau, and he was uh, guided by Professor Chancy from Grenoble, one of the pioneers of myocell. And they uh, tested uh, different, uh, uh, on different positions, the structure formation. Mm -hmm. So what they did is they monitored the orientation, they monitored the crystallinity and they found out, and this is also what we practically observe that the fiber is constantly relaxing. So when, so when you take a fibers from the shelf after one year and you measure the Mechanical properties, they differ a lot, mm -hmm. uh, especially because um, we, had a lot, <laughs> we had a lot of discussions with customers who came and say, oh, the crystallinity or the elongation or the tenacity has changed over time. And then we started to make systematic studies with conventional lyosol fibers and observed that over time, the relaxation continues. So it's a frozen structure. So it's not... Uh, like when you go into, um, yeah, like in a, in a viscous fiber, for example. Or should I continue? I do, if I may. Also pretty technical. Um, I've seen some, so you presented some, some uh, um, attempts on modifying the spinneret. I'm also wondering how important is what happens before that. And I don't know if it's a piston system, screw system, or some sort of pump and whether or not these stresses or deformations generated right before the die also play a significant role or not? Yeah, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, I have to say we have not yet studied in detail um, the structure changes within uh, the uh, orifice. Yeah, so uh, just showing what happens in uh, 
the uh, uh, capillary. Uh, that's very difficult. We, what we are doing now is uh, uh, to measure with uh, high pressure capillary viscosimeter how, because you, you um, have typical share rates of 10 to the power five in 10 to the power four to 10 to the power six uh, per second share rates inside uh, the capillaries. And uh, what we see is with this high draw ratio, we have almost um, no uh, uh, um, when we exit the uh, the filament, we have almost uh, no change in the in the structure. Uh, but then we have immediately the change to elongational extensional viscosity, and that is the next thing what we want to investigate. There was uh, more than ten years ago. Uh, people also from Lansing together with uh, with the neutron scattering in Grunover. And they basically recorded different scattering uh, curves and basically also found out <clears throat> that there is a, a very, uh, let's say, uh, homogeneous structure formation. So that is reflected also in the cross-sectional um, uh, cross-sectional structure with uh, uniform nanofibrillar structure, but uh, uh, they could not really found out, find out really uh, the, the reason for that. So they also assumed that it might be due to this uh, spinodal decomposition. But the, the problem is that you don't have a model for high concentrated polymer solutions. That's one of the problem. Of course, we can uh, add some, we did some COMSOL modeling what happens in the uh, capillary during the sharing at different extrusion velocities, different temperatures, different molar masses, different that, that we can do, but the model is wrong. It's not uh, suitable for uh, this high consistency or high concentrated uh, polymer solutions just for highly diluted solutions. Yeah? So you always need to make uh, some assumptions and that's the, the speculation then. So we also have not unfortunately uh, clearly uh, identified certain breaches. We have of course under certain conditions, uh, breaches of the filaments during the spinning and it's very difficult to attribute the origin of the breaches in all the cases. Yeah? What we see is, of course, when you have a gel formation, that is uh, then a simple case, then you can trace back that to gel formation. Okay, but unfortunately, I cannot give you a really good answer to that. And this is something what my um, successors need to address in the future. So there's a lot to study. Fantastic, many thanks. Many thanks. Do you have uh, more questions, uh, Roland, or should I? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, uh, it was just a little bit, I was a little bit curious about the high purity cellulose where HPG, uh, and you compare it with a less purified uh, batch. Uh, and you said that the higher had a higher viscosity uh, and you got uh, better values. Is that due to that? Uh, you orient the five uh, the uh, cellulosa better when it has higher viscosity, or what? What is the reason? Yeah. <clears throat> what is the correlation between mm. there? Mm. Yeah, this, this is also a hypothesis. So what we see when we change from a broadly distributed standard prehydrolysis craft bulk with high amount of hemicellulosis with a very purified uh, cellulose like this. Uh, so-called uh, cord pulp, uh, or also cotton, cotton lintus is the same. Then you have a relatively uniform um, number of long chains. Mm. Yeah. And what is the, the origin of high elongation is that you, you cleave, you break the hydrogen bonding and you reform the hydrogen bonding while extending the molecules. Yeah? So if you have a higher density of hydrogen bonding, 
which is the case in the um, in this high purity pulp compared to the other pulp. For example, the sulfide pulp, which is very broadly distributed, has much lower strength properties compared to the pre adolescent craft pulp already. So this is, of course, a hypothesis. And as long as we don't have um, experimental proof that it is different, we, we argue in this way. In the, so then we have, of course, higher shear velocity. With a higher shear velocity and shear rate, we have higher shear power. And the higher shear power, of course, already uh, reduces the diameter of the filament exiting uh, the spinneret. So even if you have the same extrusion velocity, the diameter of the filament is lower. You can model that uh, when you have a higher shear power because it brings more or less the, uh, the cellulose molecules closer together due to the alignment in the orifice channel. So that is one of our explanations. But again, it's a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, do we have uh, more? Uh, I, I, I have al always a lot of questions. Uh, uh, Josephine, do we have anything uh, from uh, the YouTube? No, we have no uh, questions on YouTube. Uh, but, but then it is maybe time to thank you a lot for this fantastic presentation. And it gave me a lot of what we should think of more. Uh, so uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much for thank you very nice much. talk. Thank you very much. And thank you very much all of you who have been uh, following this presentation. And I uh, should just finish by saying that we will be back in the ways of finding, taking part of research in the meantime until April 5. We have a mini conference coming up uh, on February 20, 24th, February, and also several. Uh, PhD thesis defenses. Mm -hmm. So hope to see you back in April. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.